We're good to go. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been great to have you with us uh, all through August. Actually, many of you have participated pretty much in every event that we shared uh, in the month of August uh, each week. Uh, I was just sharing with uh, our panelists today that each week has uh, been shared, been sharing different uh, themes and and works by different artists uh, from India, from outside. And today uh, we are gathered here uh, for a very exciting uh, discussion uh, on Tamil cinema and one of uh, our first engagements actually at Chennai Photo Biennale Foundation, where we are bringing together some eminent personalities together to speak about the cutouts, banner and poster culture and the whole transition into the digital form today. Uh, cinema and visual art has gone hand in hand in the Madras skyline. Today, that history is being replaced by the first look online poster releases, YouTube trailers, and OTT release banner ads. Uh, we have with us today uh, Dr. Praminda Jacob, an author, art historian, and associate professor of art history at UMBC in the US. Hello, Praminda. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we have with us uh, Mr. Rajiv Menon. He's an award-winning cinematographer and director. Hello, Rajiv. Thank you so much uh, for uh, being with us. It's a pleasure to have all of you. Um, the, the, Mr. S. Theodore Bhaskaran, sir, uh, who's a film historian and author. Thank you, sir, again for joining us today. Uh, and we have Mr. V. Jeevanantan, who is an artist who has been working for many years on creating a lot of these uh, big uh, banners and posters and cutouts. Uh, and I'm very excited to also introduce our moderator for today, Dr. Uma Wangal, a Fulbright scholar, film professor and historian and film curator. She's currently uh, with the LV Prasad Institute in Chennai. Thank you, Uma. Thank you so much for being with us today. And I'm handing it over to you to start the discussion for our audience. Thank you, Shruti. Uh, good, good evening to all our panelists and our audience. Welcome to this double celebration of Madras and movies, uh, specifically to this panel discussion on Tamil cinema's fascinating twist with visual art in the form of banners, posters, and holdings. Growing up in Madras and perhaps every part of Tamil Nadu meant we belted out film songs regularly. We quoted extensively from film dialogues from memory, had trivial pursuit nights on our films, and our dinner table conversations often revolved around two things, politics and cinema. And what better way to spend a Saturday evening during Madras month and week than to talk about Tamil cinema. The painted walls of the Bini factory in North Madras was my first introduction to cinema. Um, in the, the world of cinema, in the sense that um, they would have these beautiful uh, paintings of, uh, you know, the heroes, the heroines, and some song sequence, uh, Chandraleka, for instance, and cloth banners fluttering along the banks of the Kuhn. A lot of canvas paintings outside every theater. In my uh, experience as a child, it was always Venus Theater, which was near my house, and every Friday we would land up there and watch films. And uh, this was my window to the dreamscape of the big screen. For a long time, in fact, I thought every theater would play Karpagavallinin. I am sure Bhaskaran sir knows about this. They always started every screening with that song. And I assumed almost all theaters did that. And until my father one day took us to uh, the Mecca of Madras, uh, as it were, you know, Mount Road, to catch some English film or a Telugu film. And suddenly the world became a lot more colorful and a lot more brightful, bright. And the earliest memory I have is, of course, of Rajaraja Chora. And uh, in terms of Hindi cinema, the Aradhana poster was the first one. And Telugu cinema, Premnagar. And in uh, Ulagam Sutram Valiban, my personal favorite because of MGR. Um, this drew me into a world of color and adventure. And uh, my father had an office. He was a distributor and he had an office on Miran Sahib Street. This gave me a kind of ringside view of the poster and hoarding business because that's where they would do all the back end uh, work and then take it to the theaters and mount them. Of course, this later grew into an academic interest, and here I am today, still talking and learning about Tamil cinema. I still recall a huge banner outside Gaiti Theatre or Casino, I'm not sure, in the early 70s, um, when our school would take us to watch Ben-Hur and Ten Commandments. And uh, I also recall Mekhana's Gold, huge one. 
uh, I'm sure Bhaskar and sir will be able to tell us which theater. I don't really remember. I was too young. Uh, sometimes we would squirm in our bus seats as we are traveling because there would be a very erotic poster on the wall on the side and uh, boys and men would be, you know, living out their fantasies. And often we found them touching the posters and this would kind of, you know, make us a little uncomfortable. At other times, we found these posters so uh, larger than life that we would stop and stare. The walk and gawk tourist stop was an actual thing. I'm not making it up, you know. Between Sophia Theater and Casino, people would walk and look at all these beautiful holding, holdings on the road. And uh, for the fans, of course, it gave them a sense of being very close to their idols and heroes, whether it was filmic or political. And now it's time, of course, for me to pick the brains of our panelists who each bring a rich knowledge and experience to the table as it were. How far back in Tamil history does the tradition of banners and hoardings for film advertising go? What was the culture of posters that was prevalent in those days? How did this impact the way audiences responded? These two art forms coexisted and they depended on each other. They created employment to a host of unnamed artists. Um, so to talk on some of these dimensions. We have four eminent panelists with us this evening. Let me welcome Mr. Theodore Baskaran, film historian and author, uh, Mr. Jeevanandan, artist, um, Dr. Praminda Jacob, author, art historian, and associate professor of art history at UMBC, and Mr. Rajiv Menon, award-winning cinematographer. It's very exciting because each of them is going to talk about a different dimension. And for us, that is going to give us a nice 360 degree view of this topic. To anyone even remotely interested in Tamar cinema and its rich history, Mr. Theodore Baskaran is a familiar name and he was our go-to person. He was the first person, in fact, uh, whom I met when I embarked on my PhD on Tamar film songs. Um, Mr. Baskaran is a postgraduate in history from Madras Christian College. He retired as the Chief Postmaster General of Tamil Nadu. He's a keen bird watcher and naturalist and has authored several books uh, but notable in this context are the two seminal books on Tamil cinema history, The Message Bearers, The Nationalist Politics and the Entertainment Media in South India between 1880 and 1945. And uh, later, The Eye of the Serpent, An Introduction to Tamil Cinema, which won the National Award for the Best Book on Cinema. He writes for many Tamil magazines on cinema. And Mr. Bhaskaran has been a member of the advisory board of the National Film Archives at Pune. And in 2002, he taught a course on Tamil cinema at the University of Michigan. In 2003, he was on the jury for the National Film Awards. It is an honor for me now to invite Mr. Baskaran to share with us his memories and understanding of the film posters, banners, and hoardings, and the role they played in uh, propagating the larger than life image of Tamar cinema. Thank you, Mr. Baskaran, sir, for joining us today. Over to you. Okay, thank you for the kind words, and <laughs> good evening, friends. Let's start from the beginning. That's the silent era. Tamil cinema had 15 years of silent era production. That's from 1960 to 1931. And it produced 124 feature films. But we have not a single uh, document or memorabilia from that period. The birth of an entertainment giant went totally unnoticed. Nobody thought that it's going to be such a big uh, entertainment uh, giant. But we managed to get uh, one, one uh, document from the silent era. Slide one, please. Yeah, this is the advertisement for a Tamil film called Laila, the star of Mingrelia, which was produced by uh, Mr. A. Narayanan, who had this company called General Pictures Corporation. The actors were from Madras and, but the story was of course uh, from the Arabian Nights, which has provided endless uh, themes for Indian cinema. In Tamil, you had Baghdad Thirudan, Baghdad Peralagi, and uh, Alibaba, Narpa, Terulu, and all that. This particular uh, bit of, it's a pamphlet, was recovered from, believe it or not, from Ukraine archives. My young friend, uh, Sugit Krishnamurti, uh, retrieved it by just by, uh, uh, you know, through internet research, 
and he kindly lent to me. So this is the only thing we have. And then they had small insertions in the newspaper. I've seen the silent era insertions in the Hindu of those uh, uh, period. The Laila, the star of Mangrali was a Tamil film in the sense uh, the title cards were in Tamil. But we don't have a single picture from the silent era, sad to say. And next slide, please. Then came the uh, black and white uh, posters. Uh, I don't know if you can recognize any of this. This is P.U. Chinnapa, T.R. Uh, uh, Rajagumari, Manon Mani. The year is 1942. At the same time, the color posters had come, but this I got uh, for, uh, for an example as different from the monochrome. Then in the late 30s, the film companies introduced a very interesting device called flashcards. Can we have the next slide, please? This is a flashcard of a film called Madurai Viran, um, 1939, Tamil film, of course. And on the other side was the space for stamp and address. It could be used as a card. Yes. Now, these cards are uh, uh, valuable sources of information because they gave a little bit of uh, information about who produced and who were the actors. In the rivers, you get the actor. This is Chidambaranathan, M.M. Chidambaranathan. A, a man who has got a place in history but forgotten. In 1931 and 32, during the Salt Satyagraha, he led the actors, the uh, drama actors, later he get, came into cinema, as the Salt Satyagraha movement and uh, went to prison. You know, the interaction between politics and uh, cinema in Tamil Nadu began during the uh, uh, freedom period. Uh, Next slide, please. Okay, we are now in the 40s, uh, and we had, this is 1942, full-fledged uh, posters. Um, you can also see, say that stardom was being created. You know, that's P.U. Chinnapa and Kannamba, N.S. Krishnan, T.A. Madaram, names are given. But you notice that the name of the uh, directors are not given. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yes. Yeah. And uh, they began to put them in uh, the walls. Uh, so it came to be called the wall poster. Next slide, please. Uh, by this time, Gemini uh, studio was very active, and the SS Watson had a had very innovative ways of uh, uh, advertising for his films. Now in this film, he says, after uh, Gemini Nandana was released in 1942, he says, Padathil ulla particleil mihum nandrai ulla moonru particleil teruvitthi pathaira rovai parishapurunga. That is, after the 100 day of the film, you choose the uh, best three, and if it coincides with the uh, matches with the judges, then you have 10,000 rupees in your kitty. So, I mean, and all his uh, uh, publicity methods work. Later, I'll show you one more like that. Uh, in the poster culture, they use the same artwork for different purposes. That is to have a big banner or to use as an advertisement in the magazines or the cover picture of the songbook. So it, they, they used it for many purposes, the same artwork. You know how these posters were produced? They had a thing called, an instrument called magic lantern which was uh, 
uh, kind of a rudimentary projector. Say they will project it on the screen and then draw, which is a kind of an enlargement. Poster artists all over Tamil Nadu model their uh, work on the basis of uh, Madhavan and Balu brothers. I'm sure uh, Jeevanandam will be talking more about them. These were the iconic figures in the poster art. Then lithograph press begin to uh, appear. So we had uh, first in Coimbatore and Chennai, Coimbatore because next to Chennai, that was the uh, place where there were three or four studios. Companies like Elegant Publicities were the ones that were producing a lot of posters. So there was the single sheet poster, uh, which is about maybe three feet by two feet. That was the most used one. And then there were a poster was in two pieces. They will go, they will stick these two together. Even them tells me they went up to six pieces of one poster. If the posters were, were very much part of the film culture. In fact, the culture of Tamil Nadu. Mm. You see, in tea stalls, in small towns, they had a small display board and they will keep it on the ground. And they will paste the poster there. And for keeping that poster, the tea stall fellow will get a pass. That was called 30 pass because he case keeps the 30 there. Yes. <laughs> and sometimes they will borrow this 30 pass, his friends. And then when the on the last day of the film, they will come and write on that post, 30 pass, in Ray Kadesi. That is today is the last day. You come and see. Uh, the poster was uh, omnipresent, you know. I know people who have said, do you know Tamil? No, no a little bit. I have learned reading the posters. Yes, you know, it's a very common uh, reply. Can we go to the next slide, please? Ah, uh, this is... Uh, uh, I told you about the posters were uh, given in the... Uh, the same posters were featured as magazine advertisements also. This is a quite an interesting uh, film, which was produced as a war effort film, you know. They had to support the war, and then only they will be given the Rostock quota, and then they will have to restrict the uh, length to 11,000. So this is Kanama and Kadali. Uh, Ashok Mitran wrote a review. Kannama and Kadali did not uh, run well. She was nobody's dolly. So, so that is the picture and the how a poster was used in the magazine. Next one, please. Okay, this picture I took, you know, you'll be surprised. In 1993 in Nanjangol. Yeah. This is called a notice Mandi in Tamil Nadu. A man will sit inside and play a drum, and another man will be distributing notices. The sound of drum will attract people who would come, run behind this cinema one day. I have run behind them as a yes. boy. And we, there was this competition as to how many posts, handbills you collect. So you collect one handbill. And then you run by the side of the cart and just put in your hand to get another hand. These hand bills, unfortunately, we don't have because this ephemera where nobody preserved the ephemera. I'm not able to see any uh, hand bills. The hand bill had a lot of details about the film. They also featured the credit and often the privacy of the story. Uh, uh, this kind of a lot of people 
my contemporaries recall the cinema of Andy, you know. Uh, these are memories, and uh, memories are very much part of film history. I remember when I started working on my book, first book, I interviewed at least four or five people who worked in the silent era, and they all had, they had to dig from their memories. Next slide, please. This is a cover of a songbook, uh, 90, 1969, yeah. No, 1959. Now the songbook was a very important part of uh, the film culture. It had a story, Prissy of the story. Very often the narration of the picture was so bad that you had to read the story to follow. They always wonder why they give such details. And then they will end it up with a, with a kind of a riddle. Virasenan Rajagumare Manandana Sudamadi Gadi Enna Media Vendriel Karnangan. That's how the story will end. And it also had the credits. The songs had who wrote the songs and the ragam. Was also given the early song books. Mm. I uh, the last song book that I saw was in for the film Trida De Trida De. That was 1993. I bought a cassette, and in the cassette, minutely, closely printed matter was a song book. 1993, I think that was the last. Um, these are precious sources of history, as I told you. See, when there is, when the film itself is not available, the printed matters assume a lot of importance. That's where uh, uh, the song book comes in, you know. Raja Muthya Library has more than 2,000 song books that they have collected from different places. They become very valuable sources of information. Next slide, please. This is another uh, innovative idea of S.S. Watson. He produced what is, others also produced, but he was the first one to do it. What is called a publicity folder. This is Chandralekha publicity folder. Now the whole folder was in English. So he wanted to propagate it in non-Tamil speaking places. And interestingly, in addition to the story, the detail, the credits, the stills, it also had a supplement of how to drape a sari. 10 pictures of how to drape a sari. This is a collector's item and one historian donated to Armar, Robert Hartgrave. So we have this. Uh, next one, please. Yeah, as I told you, these posters had their own iconography. It's almost like the Mughal miniatures painting, where the emperor is shown big, then the others are smaller, smaller. So you have the hero and the heroine in a, in a large scale, and then you have the, the villain and the comedian. Um, they followed the compositional conventions of the advertisement also. It's in a hierarchic scale, as I told you, like the Mughal miniatures. Uh, you see, first you had, you did not have any names of the director, only the actors. Then the director began to appear. And after films like Karnegi and Parasakti, the dialogue writer's yeah. name begins to appear. And later, of course, now you have Kavi Pervis of Ayramuthu's name appearing in cinema posters and also <laughs> the music directors like Ile Raja. Uh, it also shows their uh, uh, importance, how the music directors 
assumes importance and how the music side of the film industry become has been or as important as the filmmaking itself uh like uh, parasakti came yeah uh, kalinga karnanidhi's uh, name prominently appeared now i will tell you a few examples of how these posters feature in contemporary tamil literature next slide please you see this is uh, an example of how uh, posters promote uh, the culture of stardom by 50s uh, 60s stardom is big in tamil nadu and that was reflected in the posters writer jayakanthan never appreciated the adoration of film stars he wrote a very critically blistering attack on this on this uh, on this culture of adoration so he wrote a long short story a novel called cinema ukku pona sitthalu that is the construction worker who was addicted to cinema there that girl that woman what she does in the night she goes and peels off newly pasted posters of mgr and sleeps on it cinema ukku pona sitthalu was a very popular and well known creation of jayakanta the other uh, novel that i like to mention is nirnal mutram by no other than perumal murugan who was you know keeping the tamil contemporary tamil literature flag flying all over the world he, his father had a small shop soda kada in a in a cinema house in his village so perumal murugan was able to watch very closely observe very closely you know he's a great so what was happening and he writes in nidal mutram about two young boys who were pasting posters in the night that uh, novel has not yet been translated but i'm sure it will be their life the problems that they face then this was followed by another novel called nilal mutrathu ninaivu nilal mutram can be a place of shadow nilal mutrathu ninaivu there he talks about himself doing that job permal murugan himself went and pasted wall posters his own experience so this uh, film posters has been part of film culture omnipresent but still they are rare to find i'll tell you one story and wind up my presentation you know actor radhika acted in kilake pogum rail 1978 and she wanted to have an event before the uh locked up and she went looking for a poster of kireke pogum rail 1928 she couldn't get it for love or for money so it is so rare we do not preserve anything related to cinema the even uh, even though it's only 100 years old that's where all many of the pictures that i showed you are from rmr and rmr will preserve these things chetiar uthe chetiar had himself preserved many of these things so at least from now on i think we should create an awareness thanks for listening thank you so much uh, mr theodore baskaran
I'm always learning. Every time you speak, there's so much we learn, all of us. Um, and as always, I've taken notes. And I'm going to quickly just encapsulate it so that the audience can note down some of these points. And if you have any questions that you would like to ask Mr. Baskaran, please note it down and wait. And at the end of all the presentations, we'll give you an opportunity to question them. Just a quick reminder. So I'm going to quickly just run through some of the points, not in a very... Uh, long sentences, just the phrases I'm going to put out there that he's mentioned. He spoke about the um, impactful role that cinema played in the freedom movement and how that sowed the seeds for that symbiotic connection between uh, politics and cinema in Tamil Nadu. He spoke about the studio system and the introduction of flashcards, which was something that was fascinating, especially because it can also be used as postcards. Uh, then he spoke about how the star system evolved initially and you had stars uh, prominently featured. And uh, the innovative marketing strategies like the song contest. And it was very interesting on that particular thing. It said 87 uh, So those kinds of really interesting um, ways of marketing uh, cinema from very early on in the 40s. He started with the 40s and then moved down and told us about how this artwork had multiple uses across media platforms for banners, for magazine ads, for songbooks, and so on. He spoke about the magic lantern technology, the technique but that artists used as a kind of base to continue their own work. And then uh, the entry of lithography in Madras and in Coimbatore. He particularly mentioned elegant publicities as one of the pioneers. Uh, or the most prolific of those. And then uh, how film in uh, Tamil Nadu itself has taken this culture uh, to become part of the landscape. And uh, he, there was that interesting anecdote about 30 passes in the tea kadais. Um, I wish I could have that now. I think we, we have still have that kind of patronage for tea kadais. And if we can do this, it might be a new way of marketing cinema. Uh, the cinema one days, even I have memories of running behind it because I lived in Perambur, which is more like a suburb. And we, we had these one days running through our streets. And then of course the handbills and how much information was fitted into those handbills. And tragically, we don't have too many of those. Um, also the fact that cinema is all about memories. And I think we are all still here because of those memories. And that's why we are spending the Saturday evening here. Uh, he spoke about also the extensive musical information given in songbooks, along with the credits for all the creative collaborators in that film. And uh, those little uh, hooks, again, in the form of riddles. And it immediately reminded me of Rajamauli and saying, Kattapa killing, uh, ba you know, why did he kill Bahubali? Who, why, you know, that, that whole, uh, it brought that back. And I said, oh, okay, this was an age-old technique that he's just revived now. So that's a very interesting kind of, connection to contemporary uh, stuff. And then publicity folders, he spoke about Chandraleka. Also, I think, sir, because Chandraleka was one of the early films to go out of India and, and screen in the US. So could be one of the reasons why he decided to have everything in English and that interesting thing about sari drapes to uh, you know give a certain cultural overtone to the whole thing. Um, then he spoke about how the Mughal miniatures and the art and aesthetics of those influenced the iconography of uh, cinema posters. Um, also very interesting insights into contemporary use of posters in cinema in Tamil, star, uh, in Tamil literature, particularly with Jayakanthan and Perumal Murugan. And of course, uh, the fact that even if uh, uh, Radhika was willing to spend tons of money, she's not going to get her poster. Sometimes we do manage to get some posters here in Miran Sahib Street or in uh, um, Madurai sometimes. Um, maybe uh, we need to inform her. Thank you, sir, for that meticulous presentation that transported us back to that time and brought us back to the present. Um, spectators and film goers perspective then leads us to uh, that little point he made about Permal Murugan himself uh, sticking the posters on the walls in the night. No, that's something that even we have noticed. And sometimes we would beg them for the poster, say, Ore or copy kurungana for us, you know. Uh, that leads us directly to our next speaker, to the artists behind these visions. Uh, did the art of cinema posters and hoardings flourish only in Madras? Of course not. The Tamar cinema landscape spreads across every Tamar speaking town and village in Tamar Nadu whether it's Chennai, Madurai, Coimbatore, Trichy, Kanyakumari, Salem, Tirunelveli, and in Sri Lanka also. Uh, in fact, I found one poster maybe a little later when we have some time. I can show that poster of something in Trincomali. Uh, if there was a yardstick for film success, they usually say Mad Madurai was the litmus test and the patronage of other cities across TN was much later. 
what were the methods adopted by artists to present these films and the stars and their unique selling points uh the complementary industry that grew out of cinema's need to advertise uh employed a huge amount of labor artists painters carpenters laborers to mount the scaffolding and erect the banners hoardings and cutouts and so on in fact there was one statistic that said at the beginning of 2000 there were nearly 6000 people in chennai alone whose livelihood depended on this but many are today left without a livelihood and others make do with other new occupations but one of them still keeps his love for banner art alive we are fortunate today to have with us a unique banner artist who entered the world of cinema art at the age of 19 following in his father's footsteps into a family tradition and business mr v jivanandan thank you sir for joining us today uh, mr jivanandan is the elder son of n velayudam a famous artist and the proprietor of cine arts established in 1954 he is the president of chitrakala academy an association for artists in coimbatore he has been a cinema banner artist and and has painted thousands of giant banners an art which is almost extinct now jivanandan sir has been exhibiting his paintings since 1979 in all chitrakala academy annual art exhibitions at coimbatore chennai and bangalore he has been selected as one of the 133 painters from all over india to paint kural ovium exhibited since 2000 at the unveiling of the valluvar statue at kanyakumari During the 1980s, he wrote cinema reviews in the famous magazine Kalki as a student writer, and as a student artist in Visayagal, a youth magazine edited by Marlon during the 80s with director Vasan, Jayanta, Sri Balakrishnan, and Marshall. In 2010, his book Tirai Chile won the National Film Awards for one of the best books on cinema. So the art of banner making is tied to the emergence of these banners as a powerful marketing tool. What was it like? to be a part of the pioneering family of cine arts how did your father you and your team of artists cope with the growing demand please share with us your experiences over yeah. to us <coughs> actually i was born with banners that that that, that uh, because before my birth my father has started this business just when i was born then after some two or three years when he began to work i walked with him to the workshop to our studio so right from my childhood i have been with banners and cutouts so uh, as mr baskaran has said our banner culture has started from chandralekha to be precisely from chennai only from chennai only banners spread over to mumbai and calcutta we uh, mr wasan me giant sizes of cutouts people used to say that the jimiki of t r rajakumari will be the size of 10 by 5 it will be so huge uh, uh, mumbai fans and calcutta fans were shocked to see this uh, it was a real miracle for them to see such large cutouts and banners before a theater it was something new because they have been used to posters printed posters and other things like the tricycle the uh, plenty of as uh, mr baskar said there are plenty of media to reach the people to uh, give away what the cinema had to the people they used plenty of media then when cinema banners were introduced everything gave, became a somewhat a innovation because the sizes were huge to, uh, the image of the stars were blown up to 10 feet 20 sometimes 40 also because they were joined together it was a it, uh, what uh, fans were amazed at the sight of banners and cutouts then in chennai there were plenty of people like um, uh, baskar sir said balu brothers brahma there were plenty of artists who started this work they made uh, cutouts for mount road for theaters for territories around chennai city for south arcad north arcad which were nearby territories so they they were doing but we we are from coimbatore actually my father started in coimbatore apart from chennai coimbatore trichy selam and madurai had banner artists no other city had then for, they were sending the banners and cutouts to the surrounding areas uh, for example if we were, we were working in coimbatore we'll be assigned orders for coimbatore e road and uti districts during that period so uti tirupur pollachi udumalapete all cities were covered by us so it was a it was a really a great time for us and i grew along with it then the process of a banner has a lot 
labor side is very big. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have uh, right from a Gada. We need Gada for a cloth for making yeah. a canvas. We can't afford to buy Gada in bales. Uh, in uh, so we have to go for cut pieces. Mm -hmm. So there'll be people who'll be dealing with cut pieces. They'll be supplying to us. We'll we have to uh, engage a tailor for stitching it for a whole spread. It will be for 10 feet. 10 feet is the maximum height we used for banners. For any length of that, we can use the cloth. We should stitch it. Then we need carpenters for making frames. We'll have to go to sawmills. We have to cut the reapers one and a half inches reapers by 10 feet. Then we should engage the carpenters. We had a great big unit. Actually, a, a studio will be having at least 10 to 15 workers to behind the banner. So after stretching the cloth on the frame or the wooden frame, uh, say 20 by 10, 20 feet by 10, after stretching it, a coat of water coat, that's what we used to call it, water coat. It's a mixture of gum. Gum means vajram. It's a very smelly thing. People yeah. can't move away in there. Vajram with chalk powder. Chalk powder to make it stronger. Then we'll apply a base on the cloth. After it has been dry, a varnish or oil coat, that's what we used to, the term is oil coat. We will mix linseed oil, the pure linseed oil, what we use for canvas paintings, like you see behind. We used for the large banners also. We used to buy in barrels. 20 liter barrels only, linseed oil. So we'll mix the, the varnish and other things with the. So we'll give a prime coat. Only on a prime coat, the colors will be sticking. Otherwise, it will absorb, the cloth will absorb. So it's a laborious process. Then after, the, like this, we'll be making plenty of banners. At a whole stretch, you will be making plenty of banners. After that, uh, uh, then the next process, sketching. As uh, Mr. Baskar said, we, we also use that magic lantern. Magic lantern is a simple device where we used to project slides on the screens. Cinema slides, that's why that's the cinema slides will be either three or four inches square. It will be on a film or, a, or on a glass print. That's what my father used to develop. The, uh, I'll, I'll come to that. We used to la uh, magic lantern for projecting. The, uh, the same magic lantern was used in theaters for slides also. Later, the uh, process was changed. So it was a very old uh, style of uh, sketching. For that, we need a negative. So for, we'll be uh, supplied with still photographs. Distributors are our clients. Either distributors or theater owners. Yeah. They'll be giving the uh, photo cards. Photo cards are stills. Photo cards will be in bigger size. Stills will be either by 12 by 8 will be the maximum size of a still. Black and white was the medium we, we got. Because still the 70s and 80s, uh, even before the color negative prints came for movies, the black and white stills were supplied for publicity purpose. Only during the period of Vasanda Malige and other some films, original color stills were given. Before that, black and white. So we, my father used to recopy the still in a dark room, in a, our house will be converted as a dark room. Our house will be a very small 10 by 10 house. He'll uh, put out the lights, he'll have a camera, he'll shoot the uh, photo. Then he'll recopy it and make a negative on the slide. Then he'll take it to his studio and he'll project it on the screen. So before that, he has to make a layout in mind. The layout won't be supplied by the distributors. Generally, Chennai artists will be given layouts because the directors, producers, everybody will be there. They'll be given a basic layout. For Ch Coimbatore, uh, we didn't need that. We'll be getting the still. So he'll make a mental layout for the banner. The hero, as uh, Mr. Baskin said, the hero will be given a bigger image if it's Shivaji Ganesan because he, his face will be flattered with emotions. His face <laughs> will be made big. MGR will be given a rosy color. MGR had a great fanfare. So for every actor, according to the actor's caliber and fame, the banner layout will be made. If for some movies, uh, for a movie, Sivagangai Chimai, Mr. Baskaran, you will be also knowing. 
வீரபாண்டிய கட்டபொம்மன் அண்ட் சிவகங்கை சீமை கேம் இன் சேம் பீரியட் நாட் ஆன் த சேம் டே பட் டூரிங் த சேம் பீரியட் சிவாஜி கணேசன் ஹேட் அ கிரேட் மம்மோத் இமேஜ் ஃபார் கட்டபொம்மன் பட் சிவகங்கை சீமை சேம் ஸ்டோரி இட்ஸ் அ கண்டினியூஷன் ஆஃப் கட்டபொம்மன் ஆக்சுவலி ஆஃப்டர் கட்டபொம்மன் ஹேஸ் பீன் ஹேங் ஊமைத்துறை எஸ்கேப்ஸ் தென் மருது பாண்டியர் அண்ட் அதர்ஸ் கம் ஃபார் தட் மூவி எஸ் எஸ் ராஜேந்திரன் வாஸ் வாஸ் த ஹீரோ டி கே பகவதி அண்ட் அதர்ஸ் கிங்ஸ் பி எஸ் வீரப்பா வாஸ் த வில்லன் பட் த கட் அவுட் வாஸ் மேட் ஃபார் பி எஸ் வீரப்பா பிகாஸ் ஹி ஹேட் அ ப்ராட் ஷோல்டர் ஹிஸ் போஸ்டர் ஹிஸ் ஹேண்ட் ஆன் த ஹிப் வித் அ ஸ்வார்ட் ஆன் ஹிஸ் லைக் த the looking at the villain as a large image was a was something novel during that day so according to the actors the layout will be made then after the sketch a basic painting the background that the apprentices and the young artists will be doing the backgrounds according to the artist the chief artist wish it will be either blue or red or crimson anything so that the face will be coming out the background should be duller if it's bright everything depends on the artistic freedom so the image is made a first coat is given either it may be a flesh tint that's what we call a skin tone is called a flesh tint we give a coat then we let it dry it will be getting dried in some a couple of hours then the finishing process the artist will be completing the image giving the proper lights and shades then the challenge is challenge of a cinema banner artist even if you have projected the image on the screen or anything if you have given the exact likeness bringing out the likeness out of the color out of the black and white still you are giving our colors you have a utmost color freedom everything is there but bringing out the resemblance is a very challenging thing then we will be have doing plenty of uh, paintings on a day because we were the monopoly in coimbatore district for a day for deepavali or pongal or anything plenty of banners will be given to within a short span of 2 or 3 days only because uh, as you know film is not an organized uh, business as mr rajiv man knows it's not an organized some distributor will be buying he'll be selling there'll be some problem taking the print uh, something will be happening so three days before the release then only they'll pitch the theaters then the problem is every theater will be having a different size for a banner to be erected according to the architects will how the theater was built how you can uh, how big a banner can be kept how big a cutout can be kept so every theater uti kambe gowda will be having a size udumala petai kalpana will be having a different size so we'll be making those sizes we'll have to prepare it within one or two days we'll have to make it dry we'll have to roll it then we'll have to dispatch it to the proper cities and small towns for the banners to be erected we'll be again refitting the canvas on the frame which they have it's a big process but everything oh, one minute would you like us to show particular images i think nisha is waiting for your uh, prompt no. for the image first image number 1 shows me painting that i'll come from that okay and the painting process this was during my young period the painting process needs a very large stamina actually it's not so easy to uh, as we look it's not so easy we have a 10 feet height 20 feet width the head will be a 10 by 10 square head from here to here we'll be doing the image within 20 minutes i'll be doing because i have to deliver the banners so we fast we'll be doing we'll we'll dip the colors on a table we'll mix it then we'll come down then we'll climb a, a goda that's what we call kudrai goda a big bench we'll be diving going up and down and up and down for a single figure will be i'll be going some 50 times up and down we use uh, mixing the colors applying it it's a very uh, the task will be a uh, painting job so it's not so easy. after the sketching uh, as i told we are erecting then we have people in local theaters will have to deliver 
the banners to the theaters itself, we'll have to erect cutouts. Cutouts are a different genre. We have to do it with plywoods. The, uh, actually, a cloth banner traditionally will be some 10 feet height, but a cutout may be up to 60 feet height also. The maximum height of a maximum size of a plywood piece will be 8 by 4. So, we have to sketch on the uh, appropriate plywood. Uh, for that, uh, we can show the images 2, 3, and 4 in a row. Because we have to cut the cutouts, we will be sketching in parts. So, we will put a line on the basic sketch. Then, after the magic lantern, we convert it to magic lantern. We have to pass the light through a transparent negative. For a uh, epidioscope, that's we the next step of uh, the magic lantern is epidioscope. For that epidioscope, we don't uh, need to go to any dark room or any other place. We have to simply fix it like a Xerox machine. We have to put the still like this. The light will uh, reflect on the screen. So some uh, prism uh, methods, Phys uh, physics students may know better. So we'll be project on the banner, same size. So for eight feet, we'll put a mark. So uh, the what we see is silver stallones cut out here. Eight feet will be coming in this cutout. It'll be coming like this. Then we'll be cutting the, the carpenter will be cutting the plywood, fix the reapers behind. Then we'll make eight by eight parts, either two or three or four or five, depending upon the height of the cutouts we'll be making. Then we'll be coloring and finishing. And for the uh, joining process uh, is a really difficult task because either we have to put it one by one on the upper side or on the ground. <coughs> so we have to, it's a really big thing. The cutouts had a, uh, something, fan aura from the fans. There'll be, uh, the, I have seen plenty of fights between MGR and Sivaji cutouts, which is bigger. In Royal Theatre, it's uh, 40 feet here in 50 feet. Something, there'll be some fight or something going on. They'll be coming to our, when we are working, uh, uh, plenty of uh, fans will be around there. They'll be watching us, how we are painting, how we are mixing colors, then the, what image we are doing. There'll be uh, fans for Sivaji, Kamal, Rajini, everybody. They'll be having separate fans. So the, it will be a, uh fan fair for the fans actually then another hazard we had is rains mm -hmm. during monsoon we can't put the banners for drying outside every time we'll be we'll be crying like that then timing of the our work will be no timing nothing night and day will be used to it. i was uh, studying in law college after law college i'll come to my studio because my father died when I was uh, in college. When I was in college, my father died. So I had to take care of our uh, profession. So dear, till one o'clock, two o'clock, I'll be working. Some for, so the, how we are uh, projecting uh, the image of the movie is another thing important. For Ulavan Mahan, Abha Anand was a big name during the time. He was a very young man. Before the Dhuvume Vilikal came, the, there was a sensation. Abha Anand name was something Sensational. The, the canvas was very big for his films from a film institute. Usually film institute students will be making very sober, uh, realistic movies only, small movies. But Abha Anand came with uh, big budgets. So the Rekla race, that's what we call Bullock Car race, it was shot near Coimbatore only. We all knew Abha Anand, he was a film distributor in Coimbatore before making movies. So. We, for 40 feet, we had a cattle race on the banner. There, there was plenty of fans looking at this. The image of the movie was something as a, like a Ben Hur movie. Ben Hur is in Hollywood. We, we made this Ulavan Mahan. So Vijay Gant was a really a nice face to paint. Rajini Gant, Sivaji Ganesan, Vijay Gant were my favorites for painting, actually. They had plenty of emotions, skin tones. The, when the light falls on the face, every, everything is interesting for an artist, their face actually. Then, for, then the, we went on with the, as I was very interested in movies, as you know, as you told that I wrote a book on cinemas also. Right from my childhood, I was very interested in movies. 
before drawing a before painting a movie i know what is the background of the movie from film news i used to buy plenty of film books i have used to collect books so i know what the film is about if it's a humorous movie i will try something humorous so you can see uh, 14 and 15 photos number 14 and 15 So we are almost at the six o'clock mark. So you might want to start uh, I'll stop. winding up. Okay. Uh, for humorous movies, I'll make the I'll make my own style of uh, humor. You can see the stills, uh, the entire sketch uh, by me only, not by the film people. We did this for horror movies also. You can see 11, 12, mm -hmm. and 13. Horror movies will give the mood of the horror movie. So we we try to bring out what the essence of the movie on the banners, how to reach the people, everything we try to do that. As the time is going on, I'll wind up now. I'll, uh, I'll come on with the... Yes, sir. We will keep some of the... One, one thing, uh, one of my fa favorite you asked. One of my favorite is 29. 29 is Rajinikanth's face. It's 10 feet by 10 feet. It was a real sensation when it 29. was... 29. 29. This was a real sensation when we erected on, on the main road, like Mount Road of Chennai. We had a road in Coimbatore. In that when we erected this, people used to stop their vehicle and see whether there's a tree opposite to that banner. Because there's an image of the tree on the goggles. So they used to turn. This is my most favorite work I have done. Thank you, sir. It's very fascinating. I'm sure some of us would like to um, have a separate session with uh, Mr. Jeevanandan, but sure. unfortunately, <laughs> we're running out of time and we have two more speakers. So thank you so much, sir, for that close encounter with this art form. And uh, the family tradition continues, albeit a little differently. His son is continuing as a leading young cinematographer today. Uh, he did speak to us a bit about the scaling. For instance, he explained how he was born with banners and he remembers stories about Chandraleka and the gym key size, a bit about how he grew up along. And then the whole process. I'm not going to repeat everything, but generally the whole idea of this labor intensive, physically draining and yet very, very satisfying artistic uh, kind of uh, work that he has been involved in. And you can see how uh, he enjoyed this and uh, how much love and uh, artwork went into this whole um, process uh, a little more on that and those of you who want to know a few things from uh, the artist of course please quickly note down the questions and i already see some questions have popped up in the q a section but uh, please bear with us till we finish with the speakers we can only imagine some of the excitement that the artist and the audience shared but i had earlier remember mentioned academic interest in tamil cinema and uh, we have with us today dr praminda jacob Associate Dean and Associate Professor at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, USA. Dr. Jacob earned her BA from Stella Maris College, Chennai, India, and her MA in Art Criticism from Maharaja Sayaji Rao University in Vadodara. Her MA in Art History from Binghamton University and her PhD in Art History from the University of California, Los Angeles. Her areas of teaching and research focus on modern and contemporary art history and theory, the visual culture of Indian films and public art and urbanism, her work documents and theorizes ephemeral art forms that animate the everyday public spaces of post-colonial cities in South Asia. Dr. Jacob has published numerous articles, book chapters, and a book called Cellular Deities, The Visual Culture of Cinema and Politics in South India. And that is precisely what we are interested in today, because we've already been talking about how this has such a rich heritage and history, part of the cultural landscape of Tamil Nadu. We've also heard from the artist on how much work went into this, how much thought went into this. And while it was not just about advertising, it was also about imaging. It was also about aesthetics. It was also about the love for the art and the engagement of the uh, fan and uh, audience with the image on screen. And that leads us to understanding how these cellular deities work for the uh, culture of cinema and politics in South India. 
So, Dr. Jacob, please do talk to us today about what inspired you to study this topic. How did you go about obtaining the material? We've heard from Dr. Baskar, Mr. Baskar, and how difficult it is to source material. So, how did you go about obtaining the material and archival data? And what were the insights you gained on this journey? Over to you, Dr. Jacob. So great, thank you so much. Uh, are you seeing my screen, uh, everybody? Yes. With the slides and all. Yes. Okay, great. I just wanted to thank Suchi um, Kapoor of the Chennai Photo Binale uh, for for your kind invitation, and also to artist George K for his recommendation, Nisha Ramesh and the tech team who are making all this possible, and of course uh, to Uma Vangal, our panel moderator. Thank you so much, and my fellow panelists. I'm learning so much from you, and and of course to our audience. Though we can't see you. Thank you for being here. Now, I lived in Chennai in the mid 1970s through the 1980s. And, but as a westernized middle-class Indian, I, the banners and cutouts that thickly populated the streets during those years were barely on the margins of my consciousness as I traversed the city. To me, they were just part of the general clutter of urban space. So you're seeing a very different perspective than you've heard so far from the other panelists. However, in the field of contemporary art, of which I was a participant, um, artists were drawing attention to the richness of popular taste by incorporating elements of this in their fine art uh, imagery. So when I traveled to the US to study art history, I became immersed in theories of popular public arts. I looked back to the streets of Chennai uh, for inspiration and I asked my brother who lives in Chennai to shoot some photographs of the street scenes. So it was through these photographs that for the first time, I actually saw these banner and cutout hoardings. The photographs separated the visual element from all other sensory experiences that surround these paintings. And then the full vibrancy of the images uh, hit me like a thunderbolt. I asked myself, who creates such striking art and on such a large scale? And how come I was oblivious to them having, despite having lived in the city for so many years? I find it interesting that today we are accessing these banner and cutout images through photographs. I think it is important to remember that our perception of them is inseparable from the photographic medium. So research for my art history degree and my subsequent book was a means to educate myself and others about this visual culture of banners and cutouts. The artists like uh, uh, Jeevanandan sir who produced them and the powerful patrons who commissioned them. Along the way, I learned about the origins of Tamil nationalism that uh, uh, Professor Bhaskaran mentioned in the early 20th century and its relation to the history of the Tamil film industry. And hence the subtitle of the book, uh, Cinema and Politics. Celluloid Deities has an accompanying website which contains many of my photographs that were taken in the uh, 90s, uh, in the early 90s and some videos that I shot a decade later. So as I began my research into the visual culture of banners and cutouts, I immediately realized, like uh, Uma said, that a majority of the population had strong opinions about them that was expressed through media outlets and that the banner art was widely appreciated or criticized. Particularly eye-catching uh, banner displays would routinely cause traffic accidents, yeah. like that magnificent banner of Rajinikanth that uh, uh, Jeevanandan sir showed us. And likewise, like, attention-grabbing imagery of women as sex objects would provoke the ire of um, you know, activist groups. And Uma talked a uh, you know, bit about those kind of very you know, discomforting images. Uh, so, I learned that um, 
people appreciated these visuals, not only for the celebrities that they portrayed, but they also appreciated the work of the artists like Ajivanandan sir and the banner companies uh, who signed these images and also under their logo, they had their phone, phone uh, numbers often. So they would regularly receive phone calls from the members of the public complimenting a particularly impressive yes. a banner or cutout. Uh, so banners and cutouts were concentrated uh, in Chennai along Anna Salai, which was a historic thoroughfare that established during the colonial period. And Anna Salai traverses many um, major commercial uh, sections of the city. I learned that uh, the banners along Anna Saleh were commissioned by film producers even before the film was completed mm -hmm. and were primarily targeted towards speculators who traveled to Chennai to purchase distribution rights. Right. And um, now the banners and cutouts were also punctuated, like Uma mentioned, many other parts of the city, particularly in the vicinity of uh, the cinema theater complexes. And these were commissioned by film distributors, uh, but occasionally theater owners. The banners that were located in these spaces were great, generated the greatest affective response from the public. The images were feted and garlanded, people danced and cheered and crowded around the images and posed for photographs. The intensity of the response that banners and cutouts generated speaks to the power of celebrity, the thrills of entertainment, and the pride in being part of a cosmopolitan modernity. In, a, in this sense, banners and cutouts exceeded their function as advertisements and became the focal point for fans to come together as a community and uh, celebrate their favorite star and the phenomenon of entertainment cinema. Freshly painted banners on display in, theater com in the theater compound signal the opening day of a film. Often these remained in place for a hundred days or more for popular films. And in those intervening months, as uh, Jeevanandan sir said, the images would get weather beaten, the paint would fade, sections would fall off. The end life cycle of these images was that banners would be used as roof coverings for both in the banner studios and on slum dwellings. And the plywood cutouts would be chopped up and sold as firewood. firewood. So um, a key feature of banner and cutout images is that they were ephemeral. Cinema banners could be on display for a few weeks to a few months and political advertisements were seen for an even shorter period, sometimes just for a few days. And unfortunately, as uh, Professor Baskarin mentioned, uh, there was no attempt to keep a systematic or lasting record of these images. They were not protected and showcased in galleries or preserved in museums. Yet the people who created them took on the mantle of artist, even as they acknowledged that they were working to please the clients and, their pub and the public. These artists gained fame in their circles and they earned the respect of their peers. I've indicated how exciting it was to see these banners and cutouts appear in the public spaces of the city, but it was even more exciting to see how they were made. And actually you heard my much better detail right from the artist himself. Uh, it's so great to have uh, Jeevanandan sir here, but uh, you know, I wish I had met you when I was doing my research. I would have loved to have uh, used all of your knowledge. Um, and, and you know, in fact, I was not alone in this opinion. Banner company owners uh, told me that often foreign news media outlets periodically sent teams to document and film the process of making banners and cutouts. Yep. Uh, when I began my research in the early 1990s, there were about 10 major banner companies in Chennai producing these banners and cutouts. They competed with each other and they tried to regulate the industry by forming a union. But still, there were differences in the quality of the products. Some company owners would not compromise on their standards because they valued their reputation with their peers and the public 
even more than securing a particular contract. Sometimes they even invested their own funds in creating a work to meet their standards when the client was unwilling to pay for the extra fittings. Members of the union, as Jeevanandan sir said, uh, included all the collaborators in, involved in the creation of these uh, advertisements, company owners, master artists, letter artists, carpenters. But uh, there was another group involved in this collaboration who were the ones who displayed the banners and cutouts. This work was done at night when the streets and the theaters were empty. These daredevil men would construct the framework of Casuarina poles onto which the banners were stretched and the cutouts mounted. Using ropes, they would haul the heavy canvas or planks of plywood and affix them securely to the frame. The following morning, when the streets would fill with people, these colorful spectacles would dazzle and delight. As one banner artist told me, we may create the art, but the dangerous labor of these men brings us our fame. So when a company received a commission, the banner studio or shed as it was known, was a hive of activity because a series of banners of different sizes like Jeevanandan sir has already mentioned, along with cutouts for major theaters would need to be completed within a week to 10 days. And, um, you know, so there's, I won't go on anymore because I will say that there's a short video also I had taken of the banner production pro process uh, that is on that celluloid deities website. Um, so those who produce the banners and cutouts were relatively unknown in the larger society, but those who commissioned these advertisements were highly visible as cinematic or political celebrities. During the course of my research, I discovered an overlap between certain of these clients who were film producers, distributors, or theater owners, as well as office bearers for particular political parties. Banner companies received commissions for film and, um, and political advertisements, and they used an identical style for both. This finding led to a key theory that I elaborate in my book, which is that the coalescence of cinema and politics that has shaped the modern history of Tamil Nadu has in, was enabled through the visual art of banners and cutouts. The medium produced images of film stars and politicians that towered over the city. These took on awe-inspiring dimensions because the portraits of the politicians absorbed the sheen of the film star's heroism and romance, while the portraits of film stars benefited from the charismatic aura of political power. Banner artists are masters of portraiture on a massive scale. The power of portraiture is to evoke an unmistakable resemblance to a specific individual through gesture, pose, expression, accoutrements. Along with creating this likeness to a particular person, a successful portrait must capture liveliness, a sense of vibrancy within the image. It's this liveliness that makes people respond to the image. Yep. The artist's challenge is to produce resemblance and liveliness on a massive scale without distortion so that it looks natural rather than scary. For instance, this disembodied head was spectacular rather than arresting, uh, rather than and, uh, spectacular and arresting rather than uncanny. The scale of the image alone commanded the viewer's interest, out competing all other elements in that space vying for attention. And also the photorealist style of the portrait was familiar and easily com comprehensible to a wide cross section of viewers. When we viewed from a distance, it might have seemed that these images were essentially photographs blown to an enormous size. But that was not the case when you viewed them up close. A sight that never ceased to amaze me was that of an artist 
perched on a makeshift platform of tables. Uh, Professor Jeevanandan mentioned another term for that. I completely forgot now Goda. what that was. Uh, Goda. <laughs> what, uh, Goda, yes, exactly. And, and in front of a huge canvas of plywood or um, uh, a huge expanse of plywood at canvas, holding a small photographic image in his hand while freely painting using bold brush strokes and a palette of brilliant colors that was nowhere visible in the photograph. <laughs> so in that photographic original, this is an image of artist Selvam painting the cutout um, that, of, that was in the previous slide I showed. The only guide that these artists had was an outline of the photographic image that was traced onto the canvas of plywood the night before using that magic lantern that Professor Bhaskaran and uh, Jeevanandan sir mentioned. And those were done by apprentices. And it was only these guiding lines that maintained the proportion of the image. Artistic talent had to fill in the rest. So aside from achieving resemblance to the person that was depicted, other markers that banner artists told me that they used to assess the quality was composition, that is the design of the banner and the decisions regarding the placement of the text and image as well as relative sizes of all of these different elements, um, color scheme, the ability to retain the vibrancy of the colors without too much mixing, which made them muddied and dull brush stroke, uh, which was a highly prized skill. Selvam, uh, who's seen here, was praised by other artists for his rough style brush strokes. That is when painting large areas, he would apply broad strokes that were visible rather than blended. Mm -hmm. And last uh, but not least, the ability to create an illusion of depth or three dimension so that the image would give the impression of extending out into the space of the viewer. And you already heard that from the other speakers. Sometimes this effect was enhanced through the use of cutout or paper mache um, attachments uh, that made the image pop further. How did the artists ex acquire these skills? You already heard that from uh, Professor, uh, uh, Pro Professor Jeevanandan, but many of these banner companies were family owned businesses and the training and skills were passed down through generations. Several artists that I spoke with shared that their ancestors were stone or wood carvers or jewelry makers. Others like uh, Mr. J.P. Krishna, who's featured on this slide, indicated that he had followed his passion for art. And they were all trained through an apprenticeship system through which they absorbed all parts of the process from the simple to the complex. And was there a prescribed number of years to qualify as a master artist like uh, Jeevanandan sir? The answer was negative. Once you reached master status, you knew it, and everybody could recognize it. It was an organic form of graduation. So um, I'll conclude with uh, a unique aspect of banner and cutout art that helps to explain their fascination. This art form combines people's affective response to three powerful mediums, cinema, photographs, and painting. The moving image of cinema is one of the most powerful forms of communication ever invented. When seated together in a darkened theater, a mass of people each feel an individual pull to the images that are rolling across the screen. As advertisements for the cinema, the scale of banners and cutouts mimic the 70 mm screens. And through a combination of close-ups and panoramic shots, they evoke the cinematic experience, but in an outdoor location. As I mentioned earlier, banners and cutouts were based on photographs, specifically film stills. And since this event is the Chennai photo bien biennial, I will evoke a great theorist of photography, Roland Barth, who distinguished between the power of the moving image and the still image. A, a film still, according to Barth, creates a wholly different experience of the film. We are able to gaze on that image ad infinitum. It transfixes us 
and encourages our participation, our actions embody these images with a lifelike power. And finally, these banners and cutouts are paintings. The power of artistic talent for the lay person is something magical. Banner artists claim that theirs was a God-given talent. With colors and brush strokes, they had the ability to conjure up lifelike images that would captivate and fascinate. As magically as they appeared overnight in a public space, these objects of visual art would, would disappear leaving only a memory trace of their existence. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Jacob. Um, uh, yes, I would definitely un take that point and to carry it forward in the sense that it built anticipation. These banners and posters and hoardings and cutouts, they were like hooks that drew the audience into the film much before it was completed or much before it was released. And they would an wait in anticipation for the film. We heard the film historian, we heard the artist, and we heard the research scholar. Three aspects that we've traveled over these one and a half hours, and we've kind of understood a bit of the history, the practice, the art, and the impact of banner art. And now, for the insider's point of view, celebrated cinematographer, director, ad filmmaker, singer, orator, and teacher, Rajiv Menon is a man of many accomplishments. Rajiv has worked with top directors such as Mani Ratnam, Girish Karnad, Shyam Benegal, among others, in his long career. His cinematography for Mani Ratnam's Guru won him the Apsara Award and the Shantaram Award, while the Tamil feature film Kadal fetched him the Film Award for the Best Cinematographer. His work in Karnad's Hindi film, Chelugi, and several documentaries for international TV networks with renowned director Shyam Benegal were much appreciated. In 1984, Prasad Studios sent him to the US to train under cinematographer Garrett Brown, best known for his invention of the steady cam. I do remember this particular achievement and uh, that was one of the things that drew me to join Rajiv as an assistant and that's where my journey began with understanding how cinema works. Rajiv's skills as an accomplished cameraman were honed in his long career as an ad filmmaker of repute. In 86, he founded Rajiv Menon Productions and began producing TV commercials for several big brands. Rajiv's deep understanding of cinema and his technical excellence soon saw him take on a new avatar as a film director. In 1995, Minsara Kanavu, produced by the legendary Avium Studios and was later dubbed as Sapne in Hindi, the Tamil film Minsara Kanavu won four national awards for choreography, male and female playback singing, and best music director. In 2000, Rajiv directed yet another blockbuster, Kandukundin Kandukundin, which won the Filmfare Award that year for Best Film and Best Director. It also won a national award for Best Male Playback Singer. He directed his third film, Sarvam Thalamayam, under Mind Screen Cinemas, produced by Lata. The film was well received on its release and it was screened in the Tokyo International Film Festival 2018, Shanghai Film Festival 2019, and Jeshion International Film Festival. As someone who straddled photography, advertising, cinematography, and direction, what were your earliest memories of posters and banners? And uh, could you also share your up-close understanding of the marketing strength of banners, posters, and holdings in Tamar cinema? And I do uh, also remember you saying that you would like to talk a bit about how does this history move into geography and space and communication through posters and banners and genres. So over to you, Rajiv. Uh, uh, hi, um, I, I think all the distinguished panelists have spoken extensively about the history and um, their personal memory and things like that. And uh, I too lived in Chennai and was influenced by poster art. <clears throat> but as a person who's getting into films, I was already in the advertising business and the advertising business uh, for me had honed my skills into how do you get um, a brand to become a film and also, I started as a still photographer and advertising. So I, I used to take still photographs for a living. And then I got in the film. And then we were in that period where while you shoot, you also had to take a still uh, shoot and make sure that your poster as well as your film <laughs> at the same time. So uh, what, what, what we then saw is while most of these poster arts were uh, driven by the star system and uh, the need to say something big is coming, something big is coming. 
So arterial roads were taken and these pictures were put. And why Chennai was so important was probably because it was the seat of the uh, South Indian film industry and also the trade. So as you said, all these people who are coming in who are going to be buying the distribution. So it, even if you did actually, um, you know, have some releases in magazines and stuff like that, what was your film going to be? How much money are you spending? It is actually a conversation between the producer and the trade. Yeah. And this conversation uh, was like, I'm big. As it started with Chandralekha, it was al always, a, it was not the director, you know, handling it. But what was interesting for me is that I was getting my big break with Mani Ratnam, who was inverting the star system and was getting the thing that the biggest name was Mani Ratnam. And by then, he had already cracked the international market with Roja and A.R. Rahman was the next big name. So these two were the big names inside the films and the associations with the previous cinematographers had become so important, like as Mr. Jivanandam had shown the picture of, of, uh, of uh, Agni Nakshatram. Yeah. They had painted the picture of uh, uh, the railway station to cue uh, the, the beauty of the song in, 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 uh, uh, in that. So for the first time, lighting had to be produced, which the poster artist was really struggling because poster art was designed to produce the star. But lighting was for the first time. So there were three stars. So there was, you know, uh, and what was interesting is while advertising profession was taking off, you, you know, the, when you went to the theater, you saw actually ads of Nescafe and things like that running on the theater and you would see a trailer of the film. Yeah. But when it came to the public spaces, nobody was hiring you know, hoardings to which were hired by Amul or somebody to do it. The people who did and the spaces that were dedicated for the film hoardings were different from that of the commercial hoardings. There was no mixing of the two. They, they were like two different things. So you saw one geographical space and that, as you rightly said, on Mount Road. So opposite Safair Theatre along the uh, Good Ship, I mean, so Holy Angels. Church Park. Uh, Church Park. Uh, yeah, you would see a big thing. Their opposite TVS, you would see a big thing. Then you would see another one in, in, uh, further down in Mount Road. So fixed places having maximum impact, the size and how can the producer say he's bigger than everybody else was, was the kind of thing. But what had happened is my first entry in it was very intriguing because I had shot this film after uh, seeing a lot of Apocalypse Now and studying uh, still photography of war photographers and things like that. And I was trying to do a film which was not looking like a star film. I mean, it was natural light and shaky camera and all that kind of stuff. So how does this translate itself into a theater? I was, you know, I was very curious. And I remember when I had first started on the film, Mani called me and said, there's this girl called Manisha coming in. You need to take some stills and find out whether she will look like a Muslim girl. So we had to do a still shoot inside, uh, um, you know, his office to figure out whether this girl will look like a Tamil Muslim girl. So we had this, you know, just one little uh, blue uh, um, dupatta that we put. And that blue dupatta, we have many dupatta. That blue dupatta looked good. And I remembered it and continued all the way to Uire song, you know. So this, this is how some pictures and visuals that you initially test with come. Because that's going to be used in the launch ads which are coming out in paper. So the film is finished and the film has to come out, but it gets blocked and it doesn't release. So for three months we are waiting. There's no poster, there's nothing. And the film is supposedly banned and it's not releasing. So we don't even have the excitement of, I always wanted to go and take a photograph of myself in front of this hoarding of Bombay and say, hey, I shot it. I could not take it because there was no hoarding. And the, so finally what happened is some news, Bal Thakre said yes, or somebody said no, or something happened. And there was a news item saying that 11 o'clock tomorrow, the film is releasing. We got to know, there was no mobile phone, somebody called. So we rushed to the theater because these print, prints were made, but it was not releasing. And there were no posters on that day, but the, the theater was houseful. 
and then after that it became so big that you know it it, it so i'm just going to start without taking too much thing because i think the time is really short so this is bombay and i was really curious to know what would happen to a, a film like bombay which is about bombay riots and how does it translate itself into a, a poster art so you you see the geography of bombay being established by the the gateway of india then you know that there is a couple you know and then they know there are riots and when when there's riot and things so you're saying no 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 but there's love also please there's some happy moments also so the kuchi kuchi rakama on the right hand side so there is love here and there is pain here and there is the city of bombay so this is how it sort of comes together in uh, in a kind of art and then the the imagery on the power of composition was what happened on the cassette cover and later on the cd cover because they became as what theodore was talking about the kind of the song book was actually being replaced by the cassette cover and thing and people stood and waited to buy the cassette so one of the things that struck me in chennai when i came here was all india radio had gone commercial and there was vivid bharti and we all waited for lr narayanan and there would be these uh, you know bits about this song playing and uh, while i studied i could hear tak 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 one day and i thought there's some morse code coming and hitting the thing and then i heard paruva me and like i said what is this what is this song it was elraja's tak 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 happening and it meant so much to us listening to that radio uh, broadcast for 15 minutes where the songs would be played and elraja music and the writer and the director and they would say bharat raja in one ovm manvasane and then they would be bharat raja's voice himself to do it so the one level radio was had just been commercialized which had banned film music for a long time and reversed and had al allowed commercial broadcast so there was an assault going on on one side there were bigger posters coming out on one side and there was a change in filmmaking that filmmaking was moving from stars to the star director so the director had to come stronger onto the medium and, and this was all changing at that time so fueling that change with the big i mean rahman allowing the export of tamil cinema into the north in north indian thing so i was roped in to do minsara kanavu which was basically make a youth film and 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 they signed prabhu deva and they called me i said what do i do with prabhu deva i, I don't know what to do with him you know so uh, i then i i told them that listen i i, I think um he's a great dancer so they wanted me to get madhuri dikshit and we went and met a lot of people and eventually we couldn't get anybody and then we were like wrote the story and i'm sure was so sure they'll throw me out with the story about a nun and uh, you know a girl who wants to be a nun falling in love with a barber and a guy i was handsome i mean how is this going to work so i had to make it was my first photo shoot for the film and it was these three people all wearing white which i took elements of advertising like a benetton poster and said so you don't reveal anything of who is she was there there is a nun no nun nothing there and i didn't realize i'm actually doing a rom com poster because the whole idea was to give you that kind of vibe that was there and how does this translate itself into a uh, poster art so when I, when i by the time i reached uh, uh, you know kandugonde the cut and paste business had gone so from from uh, litho press they had already come to offset and the posters were becoming really better looking and things like that. so we had a pro professional advertising agency helping us compose and put together rubicom was doing that for us and uh, so we had a professional photographer like venkat shooting for us and we were able to get a proper still shoot which is different from the the pictures that we had already shot on the set so i remember in, in bombay when it would be in an important point money would turn around and say do we have a poster shot here do we have a shop so and sometimes i would take the camera from the still photographer and i would actually take a picture saying hey, this is an image which is going to go on to the poster so this point that praminda was talking about how do you take a moving image and pick one image and say boy this image is communicating the genre this image is communicating the emotion this light this color this costume this gesture 
is the film and it has to be different from the other so the way the hands are and and you find all action films had guns bigger and bigger and bigger guns you know it's like it was you know uh selvester stallone was, was was with a gun in and then there would be blood trickling down from the faces of men uh, holding on to knives and and women who are crying and you know and and all these kind of emotions being communicated with 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 aspects and that's when i realized that the costume and jewelry is so important when you do a, a, a dress because you got to remember you got to watch everybody's film and say okay he has used this he has used this he has used this and i'm not going to use this i got to use something different because if you're not different it will get lost in in on the road so you are have a cardinal responsibility with your audience and this is not the power of the producer showing off it's you communicating in shorthand to the audience that this film is different please come and watch it so that became the responsibility of uh, thing and the poster started dictating that and then by the time we were in guru then you had full fledged poster designers who were like completely superstars in their own right and mr nananda was the designer for this mm -hmm. so the typography was decided separately the idea of uh, uh that it's period and how much you're going to communicate and how you're going to say it all these things come into play and <laughs> nanda has had a long association with mr maniratnam and um, he is he's done um, uh, kadal 2 and uh, you you can see that thing continuing and and then we'll be doing sarbam it was not a star kind of a film it was more real thing so we didn't have a conventional still shoot as such but the initial thing we did have a separate shoot for that but the idea of communicating a kind of imagery which is going to uh, uh, in short hand uh, get to them and now you have to bring down this image into such an image that it will also become a thumbnail in a song it will become a thumbnail in everything so you got to condense your film down into one image and absolutely do that but my fascination for this poster art was the so much that in my own films i started using the painters who were thing so i would have painted uh, skies uh, of behind kajol when she cycling and then i had amita bachan uh, behind prabhu deva when he was dancing and i would to communicate that it's a street it's actually in avm studios that i'm shooting but i would do that and and then the idea of in kandugunde and actually had a wall and got a wall painter to paint bardiar uh, uh, yeah. and do that so this kind of visual imagery which you shot hand and it's condensing and compacting an image and the whole visual medium coming down into one icon and saying this is it so i still remember when i saw talapathi i was really shocked because it was for the first time i could feel photography in a poster and there was it was this uh, i mean uh, uh, what do you call rajnikanth moving his face in a certain manner and it suddenly looked completely different from the rajni that you had seen in many films and then there was another picture of uh, in praminda singh with uh, rajni dressed like ram in um, in uh, in akira kurosawa's influence and so you are actually as a filmmaker taking many such things and sometimes costumes and songs are solely designed for it to be a poster and you want that poster to be have a definitive look and you and you have the facility but increasingly uh, since songs are reducing in indian films and the importance of songs are coming down and we are going more and more towards the western our uh, posters are looking more and more like the west we are losing out what is uniquely indian and great artists like jeevanandam who actually sat and painted and now our visual culture is becoming closer to to international cinema but it's also we are losing the uniqueness uh, that was there for indian cinema and visual arts thank you thank you rajiv and in a way that's exactly what uh, i would echo too i think as film professors some of us really feel this that with the influence of the studios and the western uh, kind of uh, approach we might actually be losing our strength the uniqueness of indian uh, cinematic storytelling um but that would be a brilliant uh, topic for another webinar i think rachi uh in the meanwhile we've got very active uh, audience who've shared a lot of questions it's also very interesting that when rajiv spoke he's also talking about how that one image and how that has become a thumbnail for 
the entire marketing strategy of a film and that's exactly what uh, baskaran sir told us uh, about how initially film posters began and what their job was and so in a way we see that continuity we see that heritage is still there very much alive and i think in a way the fact that we are all even discussing all this and delving into our memories and bringing it up means it's probably time for a revival we don't know but anyway i'm just going to quickly uh, scroll through some of the questions and um, we have an audience that is also very very clear very specifically telling me who they want the question addressed to so um this one is addressed to mr baskaran um they want uh, murli i think would like to know uh he's talking about the tea stalls and the you know the tatti uh, that they would have and he wants to know if this in some way contributed to a bit to, uh, to literacy in tamil nadu would you say that it contributed to literacy and uh, there was one more question for mr baskaran i thought maybe you could deal with both together there's a practice of scattering cinema pamphlets or handbills using the glider planes in cities like chennai Co and coimbatore when did this practice start and was it unique to tamil nadu the second question is not clear can you please he says there was a pract uh, this is mr baskaran jagadishan who says there was a practice of scattering cinema pamphlets using glider planes using glider planes i okay okay uh, you know like in chennai and in coimbatore when did this practice start and was it unique to tamil nadu as uh, a first question i don't think the uh, that the poster led to literacy at all i don't see any connection between these two secondly I have not heard about this pamphlets being strewn from uh, gliders. Uh, if at all it has it had been done, it must be a very rare and uh, unusual incident because the distributing pamphlets by on foot or on the tricycle or on a bandicoot is much more effective. then throwing it from the air yeah and it would just get scattered and i don't even know if anybody yeah, would yeah, pick yeah. it up i mean i really haven't heard of it either but perhaps there's something for us to look at yeah. in the future um there's a question for um there are two three questions actually addressed to mr jeevanandan yarini would like to know if there is is there any way you can differentiate from old posters and making the modern day poster making is there a big difference in the way i think to some extent rajiv has addressed that and uh, jivanan and sir also but sir please do think about what would you would like to say for that and um, there's also another question which says um, like you had uh, ps veerappa you had mentioned that uh, you would paint ps veerappa despite shivaji's presence in the film has there been an instance where a comedian like na ns krishnan or nagesh was given preference or prominence in the banner despite the presence of a big star in any film No. Do you remember anything like that, sir? No. Oh, when she asked about the banners of the previous days and the modern days, when we had a plethora of directors who wanted to change the film, the, like Mahendra, Bharati Raja, Bal Chandran, Balu Mahendra, when they entered the film dam, the image of the hero was moved away. The, the core thing about the film came out. Example for for Udri Pookal and other films. we don't know who the actor was it's in and uh, so we we have to make uh, landscapes the images in a shadow shallows like that we have plenty of scopes for making the banners for kelady kanmani we i made a banner with the sp balas puramaniam and radhika walking showing the back to the audience walking in the distance like the uh, times changing we used to do that for comedy and she has uh, prominence for comedians i don't remember anything like that uh, for kauda mani we whenever we used to paint banners we, we used to give a big slot like we used to give for ilai raja and other technicians who came we gave a big slot for kauda mani also in karagataka and other movies he was given a prominent place like the hero Not a bigger image than a hero. That's all. 
Um, this question is to uh, Rajiv. Would love to know your views on cinema storytelling in relation with story storytelling through photographs. How can young documentary photographers learn storytelling and sequencing through cinema? Well, that's going to be a really <laughs> big answer, but I, maybe you could attempt answering it in brief. Um, was there any particular reason behind choosing white costume for all? Well, that you already explained, and uh, or and using a column for the title. I think yeah. Kandukundan is talking. Yeah, Kandukundan. Mm -hmm. I, I think uh, you you know when when you um, actually uh, re referring to the first question about still photography and and documentary filmmaking, um, the essential difference is between staging something and observing something. Uh, cinema as a medium grew out of observation. Cinema as a business grew out of staging. But the camera does both. So there are times where you learn a lot of things from the newsreel footage that you see. Vietnam War was the first film uh, war which was coming into your homes in, in television. Uh, World War II was extensively photographed and World War I started, but it became big in that. So I think uh, war photography, uh, photojournalism, all these things really influenced filmmaking. And when filmmaking moved from the studio system of portraiture, uh, which was actually moving portraiture, to a more realistic kind of light, we studied from things. So I think documentaries and going out and shooting pictures and trying to tell stories with this is absolutely important. Please do it. And that's one side of the story. The other thing is about why white dress, because I just thought that we're communicating a sense of freshness and, you know, putting candy color everywhere is like things. So I just had this water effect and a slight bluish hue and just kept the things white for me. And even in the film, she only wears black and she just has a Versace kind of a thing. So you keep the colors in the background, but keep them in muted colors. It's because otherwise, you know, you kind of look like a candy, I mean, a, a sweet wrapper. And that's what a lot of people do by indiscriminate usage of color. And, and uh, in Colum is again, you know, when you're trying to do uh, the kind of typography and you need to spend time and your uh, title has to have a unique Tamil lettering style and that Tamil lettering style can actually uh, be, you know, have to have some detail in the beginning or end. And this was a very long name, Kandukundi and Kandukundi. I mean, there are two women and two love stories. I was just trying to communicate that. And then I just happened to put that in um, to say that this is a thing which is very domestic. This is not a war thing. It's, this is actually something happening within the family, it's something very feminine and mangalam and those kind of things rather than having mullapu and things like that. So, you know, you, you scatter them around in the picture also, but you had this as the house is so important. Thank you. Um, this is a, a question that's addressed jointly to Praminda ma'am and Kyoto sir. How do you think the Tamil Nadu guardian gods like Ayanar have influenced the posture body language and representation of heroes in Tamil cinema. Maybe Praminda, you can take it on first and then Bhaskaran sir can answer. Oh yeah, so um, so that's a that's a great question, you know, because there was in effect, what, what there is is a continuum in terms of the aesthetics of these uh, film posters is really uh, many of the artists like, you know, um, I think, um, I don't know if it was Bhaskaran sir or Jeevanandan sir who mentioned K. Madhavan, who was like one of a, a really important uh, uh, banner painter that a lot of banner artists throughout, you know, uh, recognize. Now, K. Madhavan had really uh, not, uh, had learned a lot of his craft from Raja Ravi Varma. So, you know, of the artists that, uh, that, uh, that these banner artists that I spoke with mentioned, two people they mentioned were um, Raja Ravi Varma and M.F. Hussain. <clears throat> you know, so anyway, Raja Ravi Varma was, of course, such a key figure for really modernizing the image of um, Hindu deities. 
and of course hindu mythology you know i mean the stories of uh, that uh, that are in the mahabharata and the ramayana and all of that they he kind of gave it a a modern cast so that really became and everybody knows that raja ravi varma's films were really important to the uh, the the first films that dada saheb phalke created you know the the sets everything they in, influenced so in that sense there's a real connection between the imaging the modernized imaging of uh, deities and uh, and uh, the 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 creation of uh, the hero the the and in fact the entire atmosphere of the film in some sense so in that sense i think there's a real interesting in terms of aesthetics that you do see that but i'll let uh, professor baskaran also chime in here excellent i'm not a professor <laughs> you are so it doesn't matter you don't need a phd to be a professor so you are a professor i i was to... yeah so the inr is usually found as straight uh elephant or a horse karpsami standing with the arwar yeah i don't think this is a very common posture i think to relate it to heroes is very far fetched i i don't see a connection at all okay um i have a question for can i ask a question absolutely sir go ahead uh, for uh, pramindra that is was there any kind of a governmental control on the posters in terms of was there a tax to be paid or was the dimensions regulated yes um in fact uh, you know so i interviewed uh, some folks in the uh, south indian film chamber of commerce and uh, you know talking about these uh, posters and in fact there was regulation of the posters mainly uh, because of the the content in terms of you know some sort of censorship whereby they would have to get permission when they created a particular composition to uh, for for it to be approved you know if there was any kind of content that was going to be in some ways uh, going to cause you know people to protest and things like that they would have to get the, the authority huh so the south indian film chamber of commerce yeah. were the one who was the authority to grant the uh, well it was also the uh, the corporation of corporation corporation of, corporation. Corporation of chennai corporation yeah chennai corporation when yeah. you had to do a poster you would have to have a seal yeah. of corporation each you had to go and get seal so if you had say 12000 posters to go you would uh, or 1200 posters you know you go and pay that guy some money he'll do 100 200 and you say everything to bongo balance you know because what what would what is most interesting in poster sticking is that you give it to certain contractors and these contractors will not stick the posters they will stick it near your house and think fool you that it is there <laughs> rest of it will be sold as uh, paper so you got to have influence with who their uh, supervisors are yeah. you got to pay them 200 300 bucks he says peris nalla ottidinga sir telivu ottidinga konja visible la nalla edathala and athale sorandi ungalku prominent ah ottidinga nu solli it is like uh, in the olden days when the projector they will they will say they, the fellow will come and tell the projector is long ah kaamichirunga sir padam nalla kaamichirunga cut panni kaamicha adhe maari you have to go and talk to the poster person so the you know when you go to the smaller towns you will see kutti posters of yours um, you know coming out and they are very um, bad because the distributor doesn't think this film is ever going to run here so he won't even bother to stick the posters you know so there there's a big scam on that so i'm yeah, just in fact, uh, uh, also what i remember is that you know the posters that had like this like uh, you know sort of uh, Uh, racy content sexual content and things those posters would be painted but the banner company wouldn't sign their name their company name or the phone number nothing so you see them like in gaiety and things like that but no sign so uh, you know, that was uh, another way some people got around it and of course you know the police would be called sometimes because uh, if someone managed to you know uh, push something in 
to the poster without uh, the authority. So there was a lot of drama around that. <laughs> As you were talking about pasting posters, I heard this story that you know they were they made the paste out of maida. So yeah. the gond they would call it. Uh, yeah, the cattle used to eat it. So yes. they began to add a, a chemical that will be repulsive to the cattle. Yes. Yeah, because it was added to the paste. There are three more questions. I don't know if we have time. We're already at 6.55, so perhaps quick responses. Uh, one is uh, something I would like Draminda to answer also. So uh, Geeta would like to know if you could comment on the representation of Tamar cinema heroines on the banners and cutouts. And if you don't, since you have addressed the portrayal of actress Vijay Shanti in your book, Celluloid Deities, I'm just going to share a couple of those posters while you speak on that. Yeah, so it was really interesting. We often think that, um, you know, the, uh, the, the heroines are, uh, you know, not as given as much prominence as the heroes. And definitely in terms of uh, cutouts, uh, there was hardly any, at least when I was doing my research, of, of uh, female stars uh, in the cutout medium, except for Vijay Shanti. And she really was acting like and uh, taking on a male role in that film uh, in a sort of a heroism. But I kind of did um, a sort of an analysis of all the banners and cutouts that I had, um, you know, taken photographs of in the 1990s, I mean, 1990-1991. And uh, what I saw was that women, even though they may not have always had as much of a prominent space on the, the composition, they were actually sometimes very powerful. They were looking straight out at the viewer. There was a lot of drama and a lot of, um, you know, they were really important figures in the composition, not only as sex objects, but also as like vengeful, you know, heroines with their hair all loose and the eyes staring and a lot of, um, you know, a, a lot of that uh, excitement in terms of that. So I'll keep that short. Yeah, so, I remember this poster on Mount Road near Anand Theatre. It was really big. There was this drum, and uh, you know, this is T. Rajendra's Vairu Lavare Usha. And I remember Nalini, you know, huge image of Nalini on that drum dancing. So, yeah, it was an interesting. Uh, this particular poster was there across, um, you know, and you only saw the two of them, and your face was like right next to them when you're traveling in the bus. So, wow. yeah, it was yeah and you see that they're both level, it's not like one is bigger than the other. Yeah. True. True. So it's very interesting that somebody should ask that question. Uh, the other um, dimension somebody seems to have brought in is an interesting thing. Uh, Omen would like to know, is there a connection between caste and poster banner and its distribution and circulation? He, this is in particular reference to Asuran. Recently, you remember there's a film called Asuran. And um, I don't think it's addressed to anyone specifically, but if anybody feels like answering, uh, they were talking about how, depending on uh, the cast of the character in the film, they would uh, paste these uh, posters in locations or localities where they perceived those castes lived in. For instance, uh, Dalit pockets of villages had Asuran poster displayed prominently because it talks about Dalit and uh, oppression and so on. That's one question. If any of you feel like taking it on, go ahead. Um, and also uh, asking whether there is any future and is there any way we can actually revive this art and particularly to Jeevanandan sir, they are uh, asking this question to Dr. Praminda Jacob and Jeevanandan sir, whether if there's any way we can. I don't think so. I don't uh, think so. Yeah, I mean, I and uh, the final question we're taking for today and the rest of you, those who have questions, kindly uh, mail them and we will find a way to get the panelists to get back to you on that since we are running out of time. The last question is Tamil Nadu appears to have a posters culture centrality. How can you explain this culture blossoming so much in Tamil Nadu rather than in other regions? I guess it's for all of you. Uh, they haven't mentioned specifically. So that will be the last question before we uh, wind up for the day. And of course, this is where we are right now. This is our SPI cinemas, and that's how we see cinema posters today. Uh, I, I think the, I have a small take on this. There are certain you know, crafts in the film industry which are still centralized in, in, in Chennai. One of it is uh, in, the, in the case of music. Uh, a lot of music directors who work in in, uh, in Hyderabad and 
England, they still stay here. The rest of the film industry has moved there because they want the musicians here. So I think because the trade was centered around Chennai and that was a period in which the painting was there, the art, the painters were based here. So the quality of the painting when you went to the other places was not as good as you know, people who were trained from Chennai or carried the art in Tamil. And in Tamil, Anard, I think people are very, very, um, uh, they really like good visuals and they like very strong and they appreciate, like you said, you were leaving the number. Yara, the phone pani, super air this air, and the reflection board, they will actually tell you that. And I, I realized this very uh, strangely is when I went uh, to that 11 o'clock show when the film was there. And I didn't know whether this film is going to be a hit or flop. And I was just keeping quiet and watching the film. And somewhere in the four three, uh, Manisha Kerala, after singing Kannalane and Uire, I mean Uire, decides to leave her house. And there's this house and it's lit up and there's the mountains behind. And she comes out and she starts walking down. And that shot is held for a long time. You know, it's like more than one and a half minutes. And and after 30 seconds, I could hear, and people were just clapping for a long shot. It won't happen anywhere else. People were clapping in the theater in Titanic when the, when the uh, dolphins are jumping. People yeah. love visuals so much. In Tamil. So, no, I think that's one of the aspects about spectatorship in uh, Tamil Nadu, in the sense that we see ourselves, we engage so powerfully with the screen and the image and the story and our heroes and characters. We believe we are creative collaborators with the rest of the creative technicians over there. And I think that's something that's very unique to Tamar cinema. And uh, perhaps... I think it's just Ulsavam culture, you know, like you yes. go to the temple, temple. and you participate in, in this festival. You know, yeah, where I you think are we've... Really important as the god. Yeah, we've had the theories of Darshan Igge's in Tamar cinema and all that. Yes, I mean, we, but of course, uh, I'm sure... We all have so much more to share and talk and uh, delve into our memories and our experiences. Can I have one point, please? Sure, sir. Absolutely. Yeah. See, uh, this film culture is so deeply saturated in Tamil Nadu. It's because per individual uh, exposure to cinema is highest in Tamil Nadu. This is the survey done in 1992. Therefore, Cinema, one writer said, Tamilians are obsessed with three things. Politics, religion, and cinema. Kandasamy said it. Saw Kandasamy. So this is the, the postal culture and the film magazine culture. All this is a reflection of this. You know, and even though it's a small cinema, it's a, you know, it's, a, it's not Bombay, it's Madras, but we have done about 6,500 Tamil films. Yes. So it, the, the cinema is so deeply embedded in our culture. And that is why, in Tamil culture, that's why the poster, everything is a reflection. I remember when George Bush was uh, elected in uh, American uh, embassy, they put up a 30 feet uh, cutout of him, reflection of uh, a Tamil culture. Our culture. Yeah, that reminds me of a joke that Arke um, Lakshman had put up long ago where there's a flight coming over uh, Tamil Nadu and uh, the two, you know, uh, two passengers are talking and he says, I'm sure we've reached Tamil Nadu and the other passengers are like, how do you know? Well, I can see the cutouts from so far away. It has to be Tamil Nadu, it has to be Chennai. So that is what Madras is all about. And uh, well, like I said, we're going to need more and more hours to talk about this. But thank you so much to Dr. Praminda Jacob for joining us all the way from the US, for Dr. Jeevanandam who joined us all the way from Coimbatore, to Rajiv who is in the middle of editing. And I know yesterday night also he was sitting in his DI suite looking, watching his visuals. And uh, this is something he's taken time out to share with us. And Dr. Baskaran from Bangalore, this is truly the magic of Madras and movies in the sense that look at us, we've come from all over India and all over the world to talk about Madras and movies. And that is the magic of Madras. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I'm handing it over to Shuchi for a formal wind up because this is after all a Chennai Photo Biennale event.
Thank you. My God, this has been fantastic. And uh, I've been just completely glued to the experiences that were shared by each of our panelists. I think it's, uh, I, I must also again take this opportunity to actually thank uh, two people who helped me brainstorm and understand because I'll be honest, I myself am not very knowledgeable about Tamar cinema. It's, it's again a very modern a rendition of Tamar cinema that I see at Satyam cinemas or whatever little that we watch at home with subtitles. But at the same time, I must thank uh, artist George Kuruvilla and uh, another uh, photographer friend, uh, Balaji Maheshwar actually, and both their works have been shared on CPB Learning Lab, uh, you know, across August. And uh, they really helped me kind of you know, give me a lot of threads about uh, what we could possibly talk about. And then finally, of course, here we are all today. Uh, of course, uh, Mr. Bhaskaran uh, also really helped us, uh, you know, connect with the uh, NFIA and, and uh, Roja Mutaya Library. And, and we have some lovely work that we have also shared beyond the panel. Uh, I just wanted to quickly add a small experience just uh, before we end uh, on one of my uh, uh, you know, assignments in Tirupur. Uh, I was very fascinated to see these huge sort of uh, almost like hoardings, uh, you know, where people were celebrating their birthdays and and the person is like, uh, you know, uh, painted or printed on that vinyl uh, poster as like a hero. And, and then they have their heroes, they have their family. It was extremely fascinating for me. I wish we had more time to talk about this, but you're Such, true. That would be another panel. Because yeah, absolutely. Dig digital <laughs> culture in Tamil Nadu today is right. crazy. From birth to the cradle to the grave, literally. Absolutely. The culture is there. So, absolutely. Yeah, that's and, another uh, Absolutely. So thank you all so much for being with us today. It's it's a great way to wrap up our programming for this month. Uh, and I hope that we are able to collaborate in the future. I would also like to thank my team uh, who has really been working very hard, uh, you know, to get all the information to do the work that is needed. I know that maybe I come for a little bit over here on Zoom, but the team has really been uh, doing a lot of hard work. Uh, please do follow us on Chennai Photo Biennale, CPB Learning Lab, and CPB Prism, which is actually for students and young learners. It would be wonderful uh, to also see what we can do in the future. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Shuchi. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.